is of two car designers and try, they're trying to draw cars. That's what they do. But they're especially trying to figure out which of these two cars is the most aerodynamic, which of these two cars flows the best in the wind, right? Or against the wind force. And unlike normal car designers, which would probably stop here and go to a CAD to a computer simulator in the software world and, and simulate the rest of the problem, these two folks are doing the rest of the task, the actual computer simulation, just using pen and paper. So you see here, this user is using an Anoto pen, which is a special kind of digitizer pen that everything you write gets captured and sent to a computer. And you can see they're already plotting the wind streamlines. And you're probably wondering like, how the hell is that happening? And how do these folks know the result of the simulation? And the truth is they don't know the result of the simulation. If, if they were voluntarily plotting the streamlines, if they knew them, then there would be no point in having a computer simulation. And the reality is that they don't know the results. And what's happening is that somehow these electrodes that you see on the right side of the picture that are glued to the user's body, they're actually controlling their arm temporarily and making their arm into a plotter. So this user isn't voluntarily plotting the streamlines. A computer simulator actually did that work in the back end in sort of in invisible side of the interface and is controlling their arm right now in real time so as to plot the streamlines and effectively their, their arm became the plotter. And that's why this project is called Muscle Plotter. And I'll talk exactly about this works later. So what motivates me to try to work at, the, at this paradigm and try to figure out what happens in the future of interactive devices is that I see an interesting trend in the evolution of computing devices. This is something that I haven't, I haven't been the only one realizing, but I think it's something that spans from the inception of the early days of computers, you know, when computers are like huge and mainframe computers, um, and then when they started to become smaller and more portable and closer to the users, I think a lot of interesting things happen. Uh, the first one that, that is more, more closer to us in the 90s, mobile devices became so small that they literally were able to be in our pockets at all times. I actually have one in my pocket right now. And then the next interaction paradigm that I think is interesting, it's been a bit of a revolution, right, is, is more recent and it's the, the advent of wearable devices. They literally brought computing to us all the time because we can spend 24 hours with a wearable device, which we can't necessarily do with other types of devices. But more importantly, the wearables are in constant contact with our user's skin, right? So it's unsurprising that most wearables do the so-called physiological sensing, right? They, they measure skin resistance, the conductance and, and bio, biometrics and all that stuff. And so unsurprisingly as well, I think the job of a lot of HCI people, and, and obviously a lot of you in this room right now are, are, are pushing forward in this question is, well, let's think of what happens next. And if you go around kind with and, and so forth, and you ask people, what, what, what do you think is gonna happen next? I think a lot of people are gonna argue the following. They're gonna say, well, you know, it's clear, right? These, these bubbles, right? So this is the big, the big bubble here is the user and the small bubble is the device. Well, these bubbles are obviously starting to be contiguous with the device and phew, they're gonna break through and they're gonna enter the user's body and the device is gonna become implanted. And, you know, I think that's a fair argument. Um, but what I also think is really interesting is that we already have a lot of implanted devices. We have cochlear implants, other kinds of medical implants, such as insulin pumps and, and so forth, and pacemakers. And actually many of them are interactive devices, not only just devices that the doctor puts in and do their work, but that the patient can interactively configure and so forth. And so I think there's another property, and that's what I'm trying to convince you of, that is perhaps more important than whether the device is inside your skin or outside of your skin. And I think that that property has to do with how much does that device integrate with your own biology, right? So how much um, is the device designed to intentionally borrow the user's own sensors, which are uh, the sensors are your senses, and your own actuators, your actuators are your limbs and your organ functions and et cetera, for input and output, rather than actually adding more technology. And I think that integration with your own biology is actually more important than the location of the device with respect to, to your body. And so I'll be talking about that. Um, and so what you saw in Muscle Plotter, um, it was, I think it was an interesting example of, of such a device that, that integrates with the body because it was kind of hard in Muscle Plotter to distinguish the boundary between, you know, what's the device's hardware and what's, uh, what's your hardware. If I would ask you to, you know, it's like a exam quiz, HCI exam quiz. And I say, oh, looking at Muscle Plotter, can you tell me where the, what are the hardware components of the device? You would at some point have to say, 
the user's muscles are part of the hardware components of the device. Otherwise, it can't plot for you, so th there's no function. And so that's what I've been exploring uh, in my lab for, for the last years. And, and I think there's a couple of interesting things that we found so far. So the first one is I think the integrating devices with the user's body enables us to create alternative actuators to traditional haptic devices. So that in general are just more portable and more mobile. And so in the first in the first line of work, which I don't know why it's not showing on the slides. Let me just see if I can in real time figure out why the slides aren't showing. Because that's gonna be a problem. I have a solution to that, which is this. Let me see if that works. Give me just a second to see if I could. I can share my screen. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right, so let's see if that works. Does that work now? And you can keep, you can still hear me, right? Yeah, absolutely. We can see images now and we can hear you. Great. So, so in one of the research tracks that, that we're exploring, that's kind of the main question, right? The main question is, see if I can do this. This is gonna be PowerPoint uh, clicking through two things at the same time. I think it works. All right, so, so in that research track, um, we're exploring how, how these devices can afford sort of a, a new type of haptic actuator that's more mobile than the actuators that we have. And so as a starting point, we're taking the, the, the fact that today's VR is extremely photorealistic, right? Um, you're probably thinking these things that I'm showing right here are like Pixar or industry level virtual reality, um, but they're not. These are two VR scenes that my student Jazz Brooks just did in a few hours. So. <laughs> This is this is nothing special. And unsurprisingly, when you stick your head into the VR headset and you see these two scenes, you go like, wow, you know, you totally believe it. But the reality that most of you in this room know as well is that, well, your eyes believe that. But then when you decide to push on that wall, right, on the wall against that, that shed over there, what happens is that, well, there's absolutely nothing. You feel nothing. The illusion is broken. Um, and there's absolutely no way, we all know that, that our VR headset can generate a massive force needed to render the physicality of that wall. So unsurprisingly, they can't do that. But many of you, um, especially folks at Bristol, have a long history in, in robotics, know very well that, wait a second, if, if I rewind the history of, of, of computing back into the 90s, I'm going to find, you know, 20 plus one solutions to, to, to the problem of generating forces. So what's going on here? Why can't I use this one that we see right now on the screen, which is called the exoskeleton, right? It was a canonical device to generate forces in the haptics and robotics community. Um, and, and you already even see this person here is, is actually using it to render the, the force in a 3D world, right? He's not in VR, but he could be. And he's playing with this ball up and down the incline. And as the ball moves up, the incline is harder to push because of the pull of gravity. And so, you know, it, it even looks realistic. I could imagine put it, sticking my hand in there and it must feel really, really amazing and realistic because exoskeletons do produce very uh, strong and, and, and responsive forces. But the other thing you're also already spotting is that this device is bolted to the wall right there, right? And it is very bulky, it's very heavy. It also requires a ton of power to move. So this thing is amazing, but somehow is not in accordance where with VR is going, right? Even in commercial VR industry, what we have is untethered devices. I would even say, in fact, that the VR's biggest promise is sort of small home or portable systems, such as the Oculus Go and the Oculus Quest that you see right here. And so being immobile in VR is not the price that anybody wants to pay for the VR haptic realism. And as such, I think the interesting bit here is that we're, we're much in need to solve this strange paradox. And the paradox is that we're trying to make this thing 10 times smaller. Uh, we're trying to make the mechanical haptic approach much smaller. And I mean much smaller all the way. I mean less weight, right? I mean less battery. And thus it should require less power to actuate. But we also don't want to compromise. So we also want 
to keep the output very strong force, right? No compromise here, otherwise we would not be generating strong haptic feedback for, for, for the things we want. And that's the paradox right there because motors obey the laws of physics. And as such, you can't just go and, you know, manufacture a smaller motor and then expect it to produce the same output force. It's simply not how it works. And so I think we need a significantly different approach. And that's what I've been doing for the past seven years with, with muscle stimulation. So instead of moving the user's body using a motor, let us stimulate the muscles directly. And, and I think that allows us to do something interesting via electrical muscle stimulation. And, and here is, this is a technique where you deliver electrical impulses to involuntarily contract the user's muscles. So for instance, here, if I apply a small current to these two muscles, to these two electrodes right here, what it'll actually do is contract your hand involuntarily and it'll move upwards, right? This technique originated in medical rehabilitation back in the 60s, been used since then uh, to primarily restore lost motor functions for paralyzed patients or even to build up muscle tissue. Now, what I'm trying to do here is exploring how EMS can come out of that rehabilitation domain and into the space of interactive devices to provide an alternative for mechanical actuators. Do you still hear me? We still hear you, but we have lost the share screen. Gotcha. So let's wait for the screen to come back and I'll just keep talking. Because so far, uh, maybe I didn't I did need it to show video. <laughs> so let me... It's gonna be a bit of a PowerPoint. I really don't know what's going on. I think it's my home, my home internet setup is not, is a little flaky today. All right, so I'll just share from here. You should be able to see my screen again, right? Yeah, All right, so, so what do you see in this video here? It's precisely what Elaine was talking about earlier. And it's a person uh, going through VR. We have, we have your presentation mode. Oh, I see. Thank you. Yeah. And as you can see, I'm not even reading the presentation. <laughs> Thanks, huh? All right. So let's share that and see if we can actually see that desktop too. All right. Does that work on? Yes. So what you see here is a person going through a VR simulation, but unlike the VR that maybe most of you have tried so far, this one actually has physical effects in the sense that he's pushing that button, that button has a spring inside and you feel the force via muscle stimulation. When these flying objects hit you, your arms really fling backwards with the force of the muscle stimulation. And, and when he grabs these cubes, they have gravity or they act upon gravity and they really pull your muscles down as if they had weight. And again, we're achieving that physicality by, by muscle stimulation. All right, now, now the environment that you saw on the screens was a little weird, right? It wasn't just the ordinary world because, you know, the the walls that I designed for this had like weird sparkle effects and, and flashed white when you touch them and, and so forth. And so these were created to circumvent one limitation that you're certainly thinking about as, you know, as a haptic designer, as an interaction person, which is, well, the muscle stimulation is creating the force. When I actuate it, my arms go backwards, but there's nothing informing my hands that they're touching an object, right? So I'm left with sort of a bizarro world of a ghost-like where I can feel forces, but I can't feel touches, which is very interesting. And that paper, the, the VR walls, this kind of, uh, 18 paper or 17, I forget now, um, it was actually designed to explore, is it possible to create a, a VR world that is consistent, haptically consistent, yet you do not start having expectations of tactile. But it doesn't mean that you can't go and, and try to figure out what would happen indeed in a world with, with tactile, right? So here, um, we're tackling a thing that, that you couldn't create in an in a abstract VR simulator. Here, we're trying to create the feeling of boxing and, and getting hit by another boxer in virtual reality. And so there's absolutely no way we're going to get away with this without adding some kind of tactile stimulation. And so we decided to render this idea by decomposing the stimulus into two subcomponents. One is the force, and the other one is the tactile. For the tactile component, you can see here there's a little solenoid that lightly taps your arm in the spot where you're actually being touched. 
For the force component, we're using the muscle stimulation to pull your arm backwards to respond to the hit at the right moment where your arm gets hit. And the, the resulting sensation when you combine the two is that it creates an illusion in VR that indeed there was a big force or a big mass that struck your arm, that big mass touches you and then makes your arm fling backwards, sort of a causal connection. And of course you can put these things all over the, the user's body and you can create not only haptic sensation in the, in the arms or in the upper limbs, but, but you can do all sorts of things. All right. Elaine, can you actually, yes, I see. Uh, I'm gonna try to sh share. Um, oh. Elaine, if you could allow my other backup computer to, to share the screen to become a host, I might, might try again to share my slides via that way. Because the current computer okay. I'm showing apparently has, has no, not enough bandwidth to share. All right. And sorry, everybody, that I'm kind of trying to juggle two computers to present. It's always fun to see debugging life, so that's fine. Right. <laughs> All right. And guess what? It kind of works. All right. All right. So let me actually move this computer here. It's going to make my life easier. All right. So, so that was the VR walls. And let me go back forward and impact it. Now, because I'm not going to show you a lot of hardware in my in my slides, because this is not meant to be a sort of super deep deep technical dive. I just want to show you one or two devices so you can get a sense of what's going on in the background. Um, once you open the bracelet of, of Impacto of, or any other of my projects, what you'll see is sort of, sort of consistent. You have some kind of microprocessor uh, like an Arduino that talks to the applications of the VR applications over Bluetooth, and when the VR applications need haptic feedback, they just inform it. But more interestingly. Um, you have these electromechanical component, the solenoid that is tapping the user's skin, and you have that medical uh, compliant muscle stimulator. That's the thing that the doctors also use in the clinics, except here I'm controlling it digitally to create sort of on-demand force feedback. Right, and I do that with relays and digital potentiometers. All right, now, when you sort of take all that work that we've been doing in the past years about force feedback via muscle stimulation instead of using, using um, mechanical actuators, and you actually just suppose the two approaches, right? Our uh, EMS force feedback with the mechanical actuators, you start to see that all we're doing is actually we're removing hardware from the human body and instead trying to address the same type of mechanical design, but we're just trying to use as many as biological pieces as possible, right? So rather than actuating motors, we're actuating muscles. And this one is very interesting because you might be also be wondering how can the EMS generate such a large force with such a small battery? Because the, the truth is that these large uh, mechanical devices, they have a ton of battery consumption. Uh, the one that you see here on the screen, which is an amazing device, by the way, this device actually requires a full battery backpack to work, right? Now, on the, on the right side with the muscle stimulation, there's something very interesting going on. And what's interesting that is going on is that the battery of the device is so small because the muscle stimulation is a digital signal that tells your muscles to go. But when your muscles go and contract, they're actually taking your internal reserves of energy, which is why I wrote the word carbs next to my mouth. And the battery is really just that small initiator and, uh, of a signal is not what's doing the heavy lifting. All right, now this is only half the story because all I've shown you so far is sort of us doing, doing things for, for force feedback. And what I'm trying to figure out now together with my group is how much of this does generalize? Now, I've shown that this idea of body integration allows us to take a mechanical actuator and miniaturize it by using the user's body, the user's biology instead. But does this generalize to other modalities or other senses? And I'll be honest, I don't have an answer yet. I have just a little bit of a puzzle that we've recently sort of solved that at least seems like it works for other modalities. So here's the example of trying to miniaturize a temperature actuator. This is work by my PhD student, Jazz Brooks, and Stephen Nagels, who was visiting us last year. 
So what you see here is a person in VR again, and this time they're heating up their hands in the furnace, right? So she's looking around and she sees this, this, this world and she feels warmth. She feels like this world is actually kind of hot. Now, the trick is that we're projecting capsaicin, which is the active ingredient in chili peppers, minute amounts of that onto her nose. And her nose has a nerve called a trigeminal nerve that detects that chemical, but gets confused and thinks that's temperature. And so what's happening is that as she inhales capsaicin, she actually heats up. Similarly, the power goes down, the door flings open because of a storm, and we start emitting minute amounts of eucalyptal. Eucalyptal triggers another trigeminal receptor also inside your nose that creates a cooling sensation. That's why breath mints feel kind of cold when, you, when you're chewing on a breath mint. The more frequently we, we administer or project into the air that eucalyptal, the colder it will feel. So as she walks now outside and kind of like the snowy Michigan, and she feels like it's getting colder and colder. She finds the backup reactor, she turns the backup reactor on. And now it's interesting because we have a, a device that is not really a thermal device. We actually have an olfactory device. So why don't we just project capsaicin, but also add a sense of a smell of fuel. We can just mix smells with this device. So we actually render also the smell of the rubbery kind of smell of the backup generator burning. And so now you feel a burning smell that is kind of hot. And as she walks back into the cabin, and closes the door, the cabin, the furnace starts to heat up the cabin again. And what we do is a crossfade between the amount of uh, menthol or, 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 or eucalyptal that we're emitting and the amount of capsaicin. So we crossfade from one to the other and you start to feel like you go from very cold to very hot again, right? And the reason why we're doing this is not that this is the only way to generate temperature sensations in VR. You can use air conditioned units, you can use a heat lamp, like you see in this project right here. Again, the problem with the heat lamp, if you remember trying to say that that motivation at the beginning that VR is going into this untethered domain where I have full freedom and I can move around in the world, well, the heat lamp is gonna be a kilowatt hour device that somehow has to tag, tag it along with you, right? And so it's not really wearable. Um, on the contrary, our device actually is very, very low power because it's an illusion. The key here is that this is not generating any temperature sensation. The only thing this is doing is pulverizing small amounts of these chemicals, be it eucalyptal to make you feel cold or capsaicin to make you feel hot into your nose. You inhale that and your body does the rest. Your body does the feeling of, of temperature sensations. All right. So, so far I've only told you half the story because all the stuff you see on the slide is only the output side, right? What I'm doing here is I'm using electrical muscle stimulation or trigeminal uh, chemical stimulation to generate haptic feedback for the user. And that was useful to be demonstrated in VR where it's a situation where we, we can greatly um, make use of haptic feedback. But what happens when you close the loop, right? What type of new devices can we build if not only we have haptic feedback, but we have also the rest of the loop, which allows us to do sensing. So what I think that actually does is that creates that, that sort of final vision that I told you at the beginning where we say, well, by integrating the devices with the human body, we have a sort of new type of device because effectively your body becomes the interactive device. So here, what, you, what I'm gonna to talk to you about is how to make use of the body as an interactive device and in particular, how to make use of proprioception as an input and output modality for accessing pieces of information. I think the simplest thing one could build to explore this concept is imagining if what happens when you transform your wrist into an IO device that you can use eyes free, and I call here po this device Pose IO. And you can see that my wrist moves when it wants to represent a piece of information. So that slider is virtual, it's just to assist us in understanding what's going on. But I also am in control of my own wrist. So not only I can be actuated to represent that, you know, the stocks are going up, or maybe some more sadly, the number of COVID cases are going up, I can also push them down, right? And I can also like reflect the changes and control the device. Now, what's interesting is that this is a type of device that is a little different from wearable visual devices like smartwatches where I have to look at them. This is a device that works entirely ice-free. I don't have to look at my body to know how it's posed in space because my sense of proprioception does that for me. Now, what we had to do, technically speaking, was to add some kind of input sensing to this device, right? So we had to close the loop. And what we did here is we added the opposite of EMS, which is rather than electrical muscle stimulation where you send um, current to stimulate the muscle, 
I'm just attaching electrodes on top of the muscles to sense its own voltage differentials when it's moving. And that's called electromyography, EMG. I'm also adding an accelerometer to get more, more precise sensing. With that, I can just close the loop and create an actuator that can pose my hand or my wrist or whatever body part I'm actuating into precise locations. So I can have a larger bandwidth than just an on and off signal. I can say, hey, 50% of the data, 100% of the data, 75% of the data and so forth. Right, and now with that, I've effectively transformed not the wearable device that I'm wearing, the muscle stimulation unit into an IO device, but I actually get a sense that it's my hand that is an IO device because that's the part that I'm controlling to communicate to the computer. And that's what the computer is using to communicate to me. And so here's a more down to earth implementation of what you just saw, less abstract. I'm do giving a talk and I'm playing a video as I'm giving the talk. And I want us to keep looking at the audience but I want to feel where the video is at. Is the video at the beginning, the middle, or at the end? And so as the video plays, my hand moves upwards very slowly, and I can feel my hand moving. But I can also play back the video, and I can just push against the muscle stimulation. I push my video down, and the video rewinds, and then starts playing again slowly, 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 slowly. So I'm kind of controlling that data by just controlling my muscles. Of course, you can even decouple, and you can say, hey, computer, you take one hand, and I have to take another hand and you can do sort of funny interaction things that you can normally not do that easily when you can have this asymmetric uh, interactions. So here's my former colleague, um, Patrick Yornell, and he's playing a game that I don't know if it's popular in, in the UK, but it's called uh, Red Hands or Slapses in the US where two kids like try to slap each other and one tries to avoid really fast. But he's playing it by himself because he's playing against a computer. One hand is in the computer control and is trying to slap him and his voluntary hand is on the top and just trying to avoid really fast those slaps. And it's actually a full-fledged video game without the video um, because we do have a microphone to score when you gotta get slapped by the computer. All right, and, and we call this, this concept perceptive interaction because we thought it was quite interesting and, and, and pretty different from the normal way that we normally interact with seeing or hearing or, 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 or other methods of interaction. This was really just interacting both input and output by just sensing the poses of the body. All right, now we've been trying to, to see what this information access via poses of the body means even outside of your own body. Because the, the trick about the, what you just saw is that it feels like your body has become the interactive device. But is it possible for us to expand this illusion of, of animation, right? Your, your hand becomes animated. Could I allow this illusion to, to make you feel like objects around you are animated without having to put electronics and motors and actuators and all the stuff that we've talked about in every single object around me. But could I give the sensation that those objects are animated? And so what we've uh, done in, in um, a paper called Affordance Plus Plus, and what I'm gonna show you here is actually footage from a user study. And you know, the usual, I bring people to the lab, I get them all set up with electro electrodes and electrical muscle stimulation, I calibrate the whole thing. And then rather than letting them interact with some computer video game or something, I asked them to do a bunch of tasks. I, I think it was six tasks. And one of the tasks is very mundane. You say, I, I, just, I just say the following, please take that spray can and paint in, within the lines of the drawing. And here's what happens. And this has captions, so you should be able to hear it, but I can also um, read the captions out loud. So this person says, that was cool. I totally forgotten to shake it. Here says, oh, I need to shake it. So what you're seeing is that people pick up the spray can, they forget to shake the spray can. And then they start to realize that the muscle stimulation is communicating to them and is actually shaking the spray can for them. So this user says here, oh, I think it was quite cool because I totally forgot I had to shake it. Now, obviously computer scientists apparently like 90% of them forgot to shake the spray can. <laughs> I think they just don't know how to operate a spray can. But besides that, what was really interesting is what you hear uh, is that these folks had a bunch of Eureka moments where they're starting to realize that the device is not only communicating to them by animating itself, by moving and already shaking, but the action is already doing. So that's why they have this Eureka moment. It's not like you're reading an instruction on the spray can that says shake prior to use. You're already performing 
that that movement. Um, we kept doing more stuff here, like we asked people to to do crazy things like slice an avocado. And just in the interest of time, I'll, I'll jump over that part. Now, we've been also trying to figure out more recently um, what happens when we we start to play around with proprioception, not in an active way by means of muscle stimulation, but also in a way of just transforming what you sense with proprioception. So I'm interested in proprioception beyond just muscle stimulation. Um, this is a, a, a more recent paper, just came out of, a few weeks ago at WIS20 by my student, student Jun Nishida and Chen Yuan Tang and, and Zoe. And what we're doing here is using a passive exoskeleton glove to transform your proprioception the way you feel your own grasp. So when you're wearing this device, you actually feel like your hand would be smaller, but you still feel the haptic feedback such as pressure and et cetera, because it's really just a passive device and the loop mechanism doesn't kill the haptic feedback. And so what we're using this majority for, you should be able to see it in this video, is to allow people to get an embodied sense of product design, right? Like usability test. If you're a product designer, you're trying to make kids uh, toys for kids, um, cutlery and stuff like that for, for folks that are different from you. That's the hardest part of your job as a product designer. You're designing for radically different bodies from your own body. And of course, the reality is product designers have tricks to, to, to circumvent this, right? They have specification sheets that tell you the average size of the American five-year-old and this and that. And that's all great and fun. But that is, again, it's a little bit like muscle plotter. It's, again, a, a break in the flow. You're using Play-Doh. You're designing your product. You're, like, very tangibly working. And then all of a sudden, you bring out this paper sheet, and you start going into your CAD and, 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 and trying to figure out if this is going to work. What we're trying to do here is what if you could transform the grasp that you have while using the Play-Doh, and you would just decide directly with this sort of temporarily modified grasp, like your grasp is of a five-year-old. Uh, and that's actually what we tried out in, the, in, the, in our user study. I invite you to read the paper. We actually had people design um, a toy trumpet for, for five-year-olds using the, the hand. All right. So, so let's kind of try to summarize here to just to get to a abstract, more abstract ground. So I've talked about two things that I think are very interesting once you try to integrate devices directly with the user's body. The first track was about, okay, it sounds like we can miniaturize haptic feedback. And I showed you the example of miniaturizing mechanical actuators, but also temperature actuators. And the second one was, well, it's a new way to access information if the devices are able to move my body, right? I can, for instance, transform proprioception, which is typically either just input or just output into an IO modality. So I can just have devices that work only based on proprioception. But there's something a little bit more interesting buried deep inside of this, 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 this chart that you see here. And right? I talked about the evolution from mobile to wearable, and maybe that integrated is a more interesting concept because it might even subsume in planet. I actually am saying that in planet is part of that integrated. But there's something different here too, on the left side and right side of the chart, which is that over there, if I'm using my mobile phone or if I'm using my smartwatch, I know very clearly when I'm doing something, when the device is doing something. Over on the right side with implanted integrated devices, we're in the blurry lines of like sort of shared agency. I don't know sometimes who's doing what, like is it the spray can, is it me who's shaking? It gets all very blurry and very confusing. And I think this is probably one of the most interesting open questions in all of human computer interaction is what happens when we don't know who's in control with these new types of devices that intentionally borrow your biology. And so when they do that, how are we gonna design them in a way that they're mindful of, of that shared agency. And so that kind of created a third track of our research uh, most recently, where we've been understanding the role of agency in these integrated devices. And I'm just going to cherry pick a couple of things here to show really fast. One of the ways we're playing around with this is actually in the artistic domain and not necessarily in the, you know, Kai academic domain is by taking an installation that you see right here, it's called ad infinitum to, to museums and to people. So a larger audience can have a discussion about the implications of these technologies that are sort of integrated in our own body and even take control over our own body. So we've actually taken this to Ars Electronica as well as a bunch of museums, including in, in the UK to the Science Gallery in Dublin. Um, and, and it's amazing to see like thousands of people just kind of having the philosophical discussion of what happens when, when devices take over. And so what this installation actually does is that it's a large sculpture, it's about two meters long and really, the only thing you can do is sit at one of the ends 
and put your hand into that only hole that you see right there. And once you do that, what happens is that this very scary looking device actually grabs your arm with these two electrical motorized cuffs. And unsurprisingly, by this time in the talk, these cuffs have electrodes and these electrodes stimulate your muscles. And they make you do the motion that she's doing right now. This is my colleague, Alexandra. And she's forced to crank this up and down. Now that crank is like the cranks that you guys have for camping when you're trying to generate power. So that crank is actually harvesting your power to make the machine keep living forever. So the machine is effectively a parasite that harvests human energy. And the only way for you to get out is to convince somebody else to sit on the other side. That person gets trapped. They start to become parasitically harvested and you are free to go. And so you put this in a museum and you can just let, you know, it's a dance of people until the machine dies because effectively this is not a, a perpetual motion machine. I can't get the output power to, to be significantly bigger than the input power. But, but this lives for about four or five hours uh, just on people's energy. And it's really interesting to just see how, how people kind of have discussions around what this thing is and how maybe even other kinds of devices uh, already today have this sort of capacity to, to harvest you and so forth. Now, more effectively in sort of like the, the scholarly domain and trying to actually understand agency, we recently um, did a paper where we're trying to essentially accelerate people uh, into doing things that they normally can't do. So what you see here is a ball tosser for those that are not in the US and are not big into baseball. You see a baseball ball tosser. And if you're trying to take a picture of the ball in movement as it leaves the ball tosser, there's absolutely no chance you could do it. Our visual reaction time is just not good enough that you could actually take a picture of this. Now, by this time in the talk, you probably know what my answer is gonna to be to this. Well, I can speed the reaction time by using a wearable muscle stimulation system, right? I attach the electrodes to you. I attach some kind of sensor to you as well that determines whether the ball has left the ball tosser. And I can just raw, raw speed up your reaction time by triggering the muscle stimulation faster than you normally could do it. And that sounds all fun and exciting, and, and certainly it's a possible way to speed up reaction time. You can see here how we detect the toss, tossing of the ball, and then we just click it, click it. But what's gonna happen is that, I should have played the video until the end. Let me just show you what happens in the end. What's gonna happen is that we actually took the cystograph and let people play with this, and this is what happens. People do take the picture so fast, that they're able to get the ball in the picture. Fantastic, the ball is right there, just leaving the cannon. But here's what they told us. Oh, I didn't do it. This was like a fake thing. This was the EMS, this was a trick. It's a magic trick. I could feel that this was, I, I couldn't even process the ball visually and I was already taking the picture. This is, is some kind of superhuman reaction thing. And we tried and we were like, yeah, that's true. It feels extremely awkward. And so we went back to it and together with uh, Shunichi Kasahara from Sony and, and my postdoc, June, we started to think of the following hypothesis. Well, if I do it too early, it feels artificial. It feels superhuman because you didn't even have time to visually process what's going on, make a cognitive decision to make a motor planning to grab the pen or shoot the picture of the ball and your mu muscles are already moving and you already have incoming proprioception telling you're moving. That's very awkward, cognitively very disruptive. If I do it too late, well, there's no benefit. You're just gonna miss the ball. You're just gonna miss the pen. So we started wondering whether there was a kind of in-between step. And so what we did was a study, uh, we published this at Chi-19, where we try to measure users' responses or users' agency response to different accelerations based on muscle stimulation. And we found out that instead of what I actually thought was gonna happen, which is people had this sort of a binary feeling to it, like either I was helped or not helped, they actually had a very fluid response to their agency. And there, there were points in that scale of, of speed up where you don't realize anymore that you're being sped up because you're just being sped up by a tiny amount, not by a massive amount. And so you had time to visually see it and decide that you want to move, but you just didn't have time to send the command from your brain to your muscles. And that's the part we're speeding up. And if you are at that sweet spot of speed up of agency, you actually have people that swear to you that they did it, although we knew because we capture their own reaction time, EMG, EMS, we could see all the signals and they're like swearing to June, to my postdoc saying, June, I, I did this, I know I did this, 100% sure. And he's like, yeah, 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 you did it. And you, we can clearly see that was the EMS that did it. All right, 
So I'll jump over this part. That's kind of the raw, raw results of this. Um, we've been doing some, some other stuff on fMRI also just trying to figure out um, with, with Jacob actually at UCL and, and Carl, um, trying to figure out um, where's really this impact of agency happening within the brain and how that, does that affect, for instance, active touch when you're actually using touch to explore your world. Now I'll skip through this because it takes a little bit to explain. So let me just uh, wrap up and conclude. And I think I have sort of four takeaways for you today. The first one is I think the raw top level message. What we're doing here is exploring what happens when we integrate computer interfaces with the human body. The second one I think is quite interesting is more of a little bit of a, of a conclusion to that is well, maybe this is indeed the interface paradigm that supersedes wearable computing because it not only takes into account new types of emergent technologies like implanted devices, but is, is agnostic to their location and thinks a little bit deeper and says, well, what is really the role of these next paradigm? And I'm saying the, the wearables were in constant contact with the skin, while these ones are in constant contact and actuation with the biology. Not only they can do sensing, but they can actively change our biology. Now, one of the reasons why I'm so excited about, about these kinds of integrated devices is that I think they afford physical modes of reasoning. What I mean with physical modes of reasoning, I think is different. The first one you saw, a muscle plotter, I think it's different to have your hands drawing the streamlines than to just look at a computer screen that displays the streamlines. The same way that we, we actually made a bunch of different applications for muscle plotter. I'll just show you one last one. Um, but this is very much one of my favorites. This is like a little optics workbook for kids or something where you're learning about how rays of light deflect and, and diffract in different types of lenses. And I think it is different to have your hand moved to pretend the ray of light is shifting with those lenses, right? You actively are feeling what, what the lenses do to the light than to just look at a, a workbook and see, okay, that's what happens with a ray of light. Right? We're talking sort of about an embodied way of feeling versus sort of more visual way of reasoning. Um, I think these devices are really great for better simulations. I think the idea of, of as Alain said at the beginning, having VR that is more physical is incredibly important for, for having better simulations. I think there's somehow are unlocking ways of learning that are just more direct. Um, affordance plus plus is interesting because you are just getting the affordance of the object, but you're also learning the possibilities that you have with that object. So while you're shaking the spray can already actively, you're doing two things at one time. You're reading the instructions because you're shaking the spray can, but you're already doing it. So you're, you're shortcutting that learning cycle. I um, mean, we're actually doing some work with Shinya Fuji uh, at, at KO about teaching people how to drum with muscle stimulation. And then, and then lastly, I think it's interesting to, to, to think of these as also opening up a certain role of empathy in, in design because again, with, with, um, with a hand more of the wearable exoskeleton that transforms your grasp into a smaller grasp. You're actually trying to access uh, bodies that are radically different from yours and trying to build some bridges to empathy in that, in that way. All right, so obviously I didn't do all this work alone. A lot of the work that you've seen uh, that was dated you know, 2017 and earlier was done together with my P former PG advisor, Patrick Bowdish at the HPI, who has been super gracious to, to do, help me with all this work. And the, the latter work was done with all my team here at the University of Chicago. Um, too many to name, but all really, really amazing people. And that's it. Sorry for the PowerPoint juggling, but I, we made it through. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Pedro. Um, I must admit, um, as somebody who's got a design background, um, I'm quite intrigued by empathy suits. I know that um, companies like IBO have used things where they strap people up to show if you're um, elderly or if you've got arthritis, how do you go along to, um, to get a bus? So mm -hmm. I'm very interested in that section there. But anyway, um, we have the ability to raise hands, apparently, <laughs> as Anne Rudeau has already done for asking questions. So um, if you have any questions, please use the raise your hand button and we will get through to you as soon as we can. So Anne, you're first. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm yeah. going to stop the share just so I can see you. Oh wait, well. uh, that's why I was trying to find, like, I don't see anybody on my screen. So I want, I, where, Is it I easier now? Where are you? Oh, okay. Oh, I can see you now, okay. Uh, well, thank you, Pedro, anyway, it's such a great talk. I mean, I can't, I can't expect less than you, so it was very inspiring. Um, I wondered, like, um, you know, you talk about, like, somehow I, in my mind, it's hacking senses, you know, it's trying to sort of, mm -hmm. like, 
use the 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 um, rece receptor that we have in our body and sort of mm -hmm. trying to recreate what we don't have, especially use VR and everything. I wondered if there is not something about also hacking them to create new new feeling, right? New perception, like, you know, mm -hmm. what if about, you say about, you know, using only kinesthetics without the touch is weird, but mm -hmm. is there no scope for creating new sensations mm -hmm. in the use? Yeah, like that, that's, that's one of the questions that my students and I most talk about in, in our meetings, because it is a super hard one. I think, I think it, it must be possible, but the, the complexity there, and I, I, I'm a huge fan of that question. I think the complexity there is you're, you're kind of fighting a big tension, which is billions of years. Okay, billions isn't exaggerated, but, but, but a million years of evolution in those senses to try to be as harmonized and as in sync as possible. And so no wonder that every time we create a new one or something that feels awkward, it's immediately like a huge cognitive dissonance. That being said, as you pointed out rightfully, if you would train that, then I think you're actively unlocking some other new kind of sense. I have this 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 big PowerPoint and deck and in my it, some internal thing where I'm trying to reason alone whether it's even possible to create a new sense and how would that feel like because and and the folks that here that do sensory substitution know the complexity of this right you're always replacing one sense for another right if if I replace the visual sense for some kind of tactile tactile stimulation array on my forehead it's one of my favorite papers from from Kajimoto um, in Tokyo. It's an amazing thing, but now, you know, I'm replacing my tactile sense at this location with the visual sense. So I've given up something for something else. And, and so the question I, I'm with you all the way is what would it take to completely have a new one, right? So something that forms new neural pathways that are independently sensed of all the other senses in one's body. And I can feel that sense. I don't know the answer to that. So I'm, 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 I'm just brainstorming with you. But, but I think there's something interesting about hacking perception in order to get there too. Yeah, it reminds me of, I don't know, I think we talked about it before, but there is some, a bunch of weirdos on YouTube. They put some magnet in their fingers. Oh, absolutely. The other and they try to- I think they're them. geniuses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have a bunch of friends that, that have those magnets and, and, uh, and, and, you know, talking to them about these things. And, and by the way, there's, 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 a, there's a person, um, Kayla, I think Hefferman is her, her last name. She has a really fantastic Kai paper, I invite you all to read, where she's interviewed these, these folks, these, these biohackers that do body modification, implanted uh, many things, including not just magnets, other stuff, and try to get the reasoning behind why they do the things they do. Uh, fantastic paper. But, but, um, but when I talk to my friends that do have implanted magnets, they do talk about these in two modes. One is, well, you know, it does elicit tactile sensations. So I've built the sense by training it on top of my tactile sensations. But it also has affordances that my tactile sense doesn't have. Like if you have a, a, a magnet implanted under your fingertip, if you put it close to a transformer, so a transformer coil is gonna start vibrating at 60 Hertz or 50 Hertz, right? Like your, your tactile receptors do not do that normally, right? So as Annie is pointing out, that sounds to me like a new it's, it's at least partially a new sense. It's not fully a new sense because the, the elicited stuff is tactile. It pulls the skin and that's the only way you feel it. You still don't feel the magnet. Um, but yeah, Paul, Paul Stromheimer is one of the people that had a magnet at least at some point. <laughs> good, good point that Kai, Kai mentioned. He's awesome. Okay, I've got a bit of a follow on question. Um, I was just wondering, have you ever experienced uh, ghost sensations when you've turned the device off? For, um, I was just thinking about the virtual reality <laughs> where, where, where suddenly you start to feel wolves even when everything's turned off and the battery's dead. <laughs> Honestly, we, yeah. we got all sorts of really weird stuff already. Um, I, I don't know if we had very strong ghost sensations. I think there's there's definitely expectations. The the really quirky thing about EMS is is there's no pre there's no really warning that it's coming. It's really really a fast sensation, right? So a mechanical actuator might start ramping up its mechanical force and you feel the initial pressure build up and then you're like, all right, exoskeleton is touching me or it's applied to me. EMS just like kicks in. And so, and so that happens. Um, and so sometimes we were like, is it on or off? And we would sort of go through walls or accidentally kind of stumble upon a wall because we, we expect the device to be off, but it crashed. Um, my former student, CJ, who did a lot of the EMS work in VR, 
he often had situations where he thought he had EMS, so he would go very fast and then ended up slapping himself or someone else that was on the other side because nobody stopped him. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Oh, is there anybody who wants to ask a question? Or, uh, I think Osama has one. Okay, go ahead. I'm going to. Uh, I do, yes. Thanks, Pedro. Really, really cool talk. Thank you. Um, I was very excited to see the third strand of research and agency because as you, was, as you were prepare, presenting the first two, all I was thinking about is agency and the questions awesome. that this raises, <laughs> especially in, in, when you were talking about potentially this being like the next paradigm, say before even more invasive things like implantations and stuff like that. It seems like this is the right space to be asking those deep, deep questions and exploring them. And I wondered about... Um, I mean, like loss of agency, is, it seems like it's almost like it's inevitable thing to have within this space. But it's also not completely like weird or, you know, in the natural environment, we do lose agency. Absolutely. And I was thinking that, um, you know, maybe maybe one one difference, I'm not sure, I mean, I'm just talking and thinking at the same time, is that maybe we there is more p possibility for us to rationalize and make sense. Uh, in ways that are comfortable for us in the in the normal environment, and I was wondering whether you thought about ways in which you can help people make sense. Uh, like you know, the example with the photo is interesting, but I wonder whether there's some explicit ways in which we can help people make sense of the agency negotiation. I don't know what you call mm -hmm. it. Uh, no, to I'm, then I'm make sense of, of, of that. I'm a hundred percent with you. In fact, the the. The funny thing about the Impacto paper that I showed, I'm funny enough that I'm now talking about the force feedback, but they actually are, are the ways that I, I got to the, the questions of agency, is that those two projects, the Impacto and the VR walls, were kind of at its core all about agency and about creating consistent explanations. So what I found out in my very early project, one that I did not show, Kai 13 paper, is that without a rational explanation, EMS is very hard to parse. And then... In Impacto, I added a very simple explanation, which one can all relate to because it's it's the mundane explanation. Well, you're, be, you're feeling a force because you're being pushed, you're being tactile touched. Okay, people started believing that incredibly. But by the way, in uh, Impacto, in the boxing thing, we had the, 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 the only time in my life where somebody actually took out the VR headset and thought I was hitting them in person. And I was like, no, 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 there's no IRB for that. Um, this is just, it's all virtual. So they were really like believing in it. And then in the VR one, what we explored is, let us see what happens. Does that, does that explanation, could it be designed? Does it have to be plausible in our natural environment or just needs to be causal? And in the VR stuff, the stuff is completely artificial. Like you've never experienced a wall that sparkles. You've never experienced a wall that flashes white. And by the way, all the VR world is kind of a soft world where you actually, instead of seeing a cube, you see three cubes all hollow and within each other. So it, it physically makes no sense, but we gave a bunch of different designs to people. And that was the yeah. design they believed in. Because as you said, there's a chance here to start designing what are the cues that we give to help rationalize. Now that was in the VR world, which is, is easy to design rationalizations because it's a black box and we can project all the visuals, but I'm completely with you. I think the next step would be how can we create assistances like the photo taking example and et cetera, where we help by designing certain elements that help you rationalize what it is. And I don't know quite well what it is. Maybe it's audible feedback. Maybe it's some other kind of feedback that informs you the device is taking over. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, and so I think that will unleash sort of a, a new level of comfort with these devices where you, it's fine to lose agency temporarily. Yeah. Uh, by the way, the, um, oh, I gotta say this, your, uh, your uh, museum piece thing with the, with the hand in, that, that's like a scene right out of Saul. You know, <laughs> it's really cool. So, you know, with the, with the boxing thing, this mm -hmm. is kind of maybe a more precise question, but I wonder what, because it's a tiny thing that does this, right? Yes. And I wonder whether you studied, you studied congruency space, about how much, you know, tactile feedback you need to make the illusion successful, even with the yeah. other, also with the, with the smell, that was a really cool um, illusions that you've got. Have you, I mean, do you look at this? Sort of yeah, let me see if I can pull up the, the, the backup slide that would answer your question. There we go. Mm. There we go, yes. Um, yeah, yeah, we did, we did. And so cool. you're able to see this one, right? So 
So yeah, we, the study the study on that paper I think is interesting, not because it is it is particularly well polished, but but I think it has one element that I really like, which is exactly what you're asking for. We studied these things independently. So on the vertical axis, what you see is what happens when you have only solenoid, right? So these are age ratings. So you watch a video of a, of a semi-professional boxer boxing you. You put your hands in front of you, and in this condition on the top in the bottom left corner. All you have, and this one here, all you have is visuals, no haptics. And then in the vertical, if you only zoom into the vertical, all you have is the tactile. And you can see that the tactile already shifts the realism a little bit, right? So seven here would be maximum realism, indistinguishable from reality, okay? Um, we have a realism of two which is, or three, which is fairly unrealistic, but it's getting there. Interestingly enough, if you only have muscle stimulation, you're still not in a really realistic space. It got higher because at least now you have proprioceptive feedback, your arms are flying backwards. It is representative of a strong force, but it's not like anybody's saying seven, this is indistinguishable from reality. And then it's only the combination of these two modalities that kind of unlocks that explanation that you're talking about, Osama, where you say, mm-hmm. oh, it is because of this, this tactile force that I feel a big mass and that big mass is responsible for my arms flying backwards. And then you have not on one, but actually a bunch of people falling into this category where they actually like were confused whether this was reality or not. Um, in the, in the, and we did a very similar thing as well in the, in the temperature illusions one, where we try to figure out how hot the whole thing feels or how cold the whole thing seems, even in the absence of the visuals to try to understand what is the baseline of these chemical sensations and what is the baseline of just visual suggestion and VR suggestion and all that. That's cool. I've got, I've got a quick question while we're talking about Impacto, um, about the threshold you set in terms of pain level. Um, <laughs> it could get more realistic the, the more oh, yeah. And is there something in the case that, say with the fire, uh, in real life you don't go putting your hand in fire, so it's okay to have a very high pain feedback. So in, in virtual reality, maybe it gets to the point where if it's fire, we don't play around by putting a hand in it you know it's gonna yeah. hurt you have you played around with stuff that could leave a bruise or um we, we, we haven't gotten to the level of intensity except on our own or or accidentally yeah. when stuff got really slappy yeah. the funny thing about about impacto is that of all the stuff that i show it's actually like the the, the weakest one because and that's what i love so much about that project this this solenoid is ridiculous i forget now i have the, the, the chart about it but the solenoid is something like it's the slapping force of the weight of like this piece of plastic is like nothing. But that is already sufficient for you to believe there's a massive force because what you feel is the consequence of your arm flying backwards, right? So that does the whole trick. So the solenoid is nothing, doesn't even hurt you. And the EMS is very, very short. But for instance, in the art piece, that thing is really strong. <laughs> so that one is the closest to pain you can get. That thing is really, really strong. Um, that's the beauty of art, of art. You can get away with a lot of stuff. Um, that is really, really powerful. And I think part of the visceral reaction it creates, I think you're right, Pete, is because we're getting to like the nociceptors. We're getting to like serious, like infliction of strong visceral stuff. And we're like, oh my God, this is, this is next level stuff. Um, but, but, but I do like what you mentioned about the, the, the heat. The, the further we got uh, in the heat project was that somebody took out, I forget it was their scarf or their, it was not a scarf. I think that somebody took out their, their the jacket while they were trying the one and we were so proud my student jazz they were jumping around like somebody took out the the thing you really think it's getting hot in the room um but but nothing nothing as dramatic as what you said although i think you're right on the money i think that's the ultimate the ultimate test if somebody thinks it's so hot they won't put their hands in it that well that's that's beyond vr now that's a good point great (laughs) yes we're not there the, the the heat stuff is it still feels somewhat we compare to like local heat. It feels more like an ambient heat, I would say. Great. Hi, sorry. I, I just wanted to kind of follow on from, from Pete's comment because one thing I was thinking is obviously like it's really immersive. Um, and it, was, it was an amazing talk, thank you. Um, and um, I mean, have, have you thought about looking more into peop- how, how much people would Think of it as being reality and start having that more extreme physical reaction and because some people will be more susceptible and kind of like um different, different health needs and things like that and all the different angles you can take with that 
Yeah, I, I think you're totally right. Um, yeah, thank, and thanks for the comment. I, 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 I think the one of the interesting next steps as these VR, as all these haptic technologies, uh, regardless of EMS, are getting to this level of realism, would be to for us to start pivoting a little bit from our traditional sense of studies and going more in the the peak domain where you're like trying out what happens if if it's indistinguishable from reality, then your behavior should match closer to the behavior that you have in reality. Uh, and so we do have an art piece that I've been trying to make for, for a year or two now that would kind of be in that sense of where we are trying to generate a sensation that is indistinguishable from reality, but you're still in VR. Uh, but but it's true that VR is also a very subtractive mean. So it's it's there's something very funky about VR where it's like, I give my students a Minecraft thing that has no interactivity, no haptics, and they are completely immersed. Then I give them the same thing, but with a little bit of haptics and they like it for the first minute and then they start criticizing and they're like, yeah, but shouldn't the grass be a lot of, a little softer? I'm like, well, but before you were completely convinced and there was no haptics. So it is subtractive in the sense that the more you give, the more people then demand. Um, so, so there's that funky, funky level and we got to push the limit a lot until we can get to that level that you're saying, Kath, where we can say, say, all right, is it now indistinguishable from reality? But I, I do think for, for our community, that should be sort of like the far, the far goal is like, let's move our studies with baselines of reality rather than baselines of other haptic devices. That would be great. Now, obviously we're a little far from that. Thanks. That's really funny because you just say that you want to push the limits in that. And, and I wanted to ask you something about that because your, your work tackles the, the, human, the, the <laughs> yeah. human augmentation and, you know, the bridging this link between the human and the machine. And so obviously, I know that you love science fiction and that you are most likely influenced by transhumanism and all this kind of human augmentation. And I wonder, like, what is, what are your personal boundaries and, and do you have an ethical code of conduct uh, where would you stop in, into that? And I'm asking more like your your opinion as a researcher, but mm -hmm. as well as a human being, you know, part of yeah. uh, our society. I'm not entirely sure if I'm I'm 100% on board with transhumanism. That's been that's been something that I've been always thought a lot about, and I do like a lot of transhumanist thinkers, but I'm I'm I also find the the, the well, transhumanism itself is a bit convoluted with different strands with different people meaning different things. But but I think the one thing that I'm quite excited about is that, and this maybe is, is the root of transhumanism, it just got diluted, is that we have evolved with tools, right? If you try to trace the evolution of, of, of this species that we are, and you take out tools, it's like good luck. There's absolutely nothing we would have done without tools. And so what I'm interested in, what happens when the tools get a little bit more complex and more interactive, and that started happening with, I think, with the inception of, of, of first mechanical mechanisms and then computers. And now I'm interested in what happens when the tools are not only animated and interactive and reactive and all that, but can go back and influence your own biology. I personally would say that, that there's, there's tons of people doing the same thing as we are all at, but from a different angle, right? Obviously, some things are way more complex to justify like genetic modification and et cetera. And I'm sure that, that, that you, can, you can corner those things into a very positive domain too, but they have easy backlashes and, and spills over, over stuff that I would consider non-ethical. Uh, whether our stuff, certainly we can also corner it in, a, in some kind of space where it's non-ethical, like the EMS device makes you do something that you didn't want to do. Um, and, and that's why the question of agency, I think, is so interesting because we definitely want to design those, those devices in a mindful way that they can't do something that you don't want to do because you're still in control. You're in the high level node that is in control, which is why I take the inspiration from the tools because you are in control of those tools, right? And so, and so one of the one of the the, the sentiments that I that I've found most inspiring in the, in the last years is that I was reading this paleoanthropology. So folks that do anthropology of you know the early species of, of human being, and I find that that by the way, by as a job definition, must be amazing, right? And 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 one of these, one of these uh, thinkers, they were saying the following, like, well, obviously a lot of points that you can pick up on the evolution of, of, the, of the human being and its biology that are relevant, you know, and a lot of people uh, point to language and a lot of people point to this and point to that. But, but one of the interesting points that I think doesn't get picked up often enough is at some point, and I think this was about a million years, 
we started carrying the tools around rather than just using them and dropping them again. And they can trace that because they see where the tools sort of show up. And, and that's crazy interesting, right? So at some point, realize, well, I'm going to use my smartphone because I got no other tool. Okay, here's a better tool. Like, I could use this as a lever or something. Well, this is going to come in handy again later. So I'm going to sacrifice my, my hand is going to be busy and whatnot just to take this stuff with me. I'm going to find a way to, to carry it with me. And I think that's a fulcral moment for sort of human computer interaction uh, motivation is this, 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 this thing of, well, the tool is going to go with me. And now arguably it takes a million years for the tool not just only be with you, the tool become animated, interactive. And then it takes a little bit more because now evolution is speeding up quite fast for the tool not only be animated, but go back to your body and influence the biology, which is I think what, I, what my lab is doing. But I think that's kind of how I frame the whole thing, Mark. And, and parts of it do touch again on, on transhumanist thinking for sure. But other parts depart because I'm less interested in sort of what becomes a superhuman after that and et cetera, et cetera. And more interested just like what, what abilities can we extract out of that, that interface between our body and the tool? But it's an awesome question. Thank you. <laughs> um, hi, Pedro. Thank you so much for the exciting talk. So, um, which reminds me about um, the, the magical relationship between, um, between the affection and the memory. So, I'm just wondering whether a people's perception have a similar relationship with memory. Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, we try to study long. I don't know if Anne was still there when, when I, I lost like a year working on proprioception plus memorizing, um, maybe even more than a year. We did try to study with proprioception and memory, and, and I'm saying memory here, and maybe I shouldn't even say memory because it was short-term memory, uh, right? Not like bond, deep bonds, because that's what olfaction does, is these crazy deep bonds where you're walking around and you you have a whiff and suddenly you're like back in childhood. It's insane, right? But I don't know if proprioception has the same capacity um, because I'm also not sure if it's such an ambient thing as, as, as olfaction tends to be because when I remember some proprioceptive thing, I tend to remember like a particular movement that I have to do with that tool rather than maybe a particular moment where I learn how to use that tool. Um, but to answer the question with the only data I got, in that pilot experiment where we're trying to help people memorize different sequences as they were feeling different proprioceptive inputs. And this is anecdotal because we never uh, like got beyond a pilot with like maybe six people or so. But it seemed to be to be that with proprioceptive feedback, people were faster at memorizing that. Now, before we think, oh, that's because you were giving them some kind of other input. Well, actually we were in all conditions, we we're giving them other input uh, and they were all proprioceptive. It's just that one of them was muscle stimulation. And that seemed to be sufficient to help them memorize. That's what motivates me to do these drumming studies and, and, and whatnot. But that being said, I am not sure if it's as deep of a, of a link as, as with olfaction and memory. That being said, I'm not an expert in, in, in memory, so I wouldn't know um, how, to, how to like tap into that. Mm. But that's an awesome question. I, I think the link between memory and olfaction is, is a fascinating one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't have a personal experience about the perception, which uh, trace back to very um, early childhood. So because mm -hmm. I'm, um, so I learned English when I was like um, 22 years old. And then when I, so when I tried to speak English, uh, so the immediate um, feeling for me is that when I speak English, I don't have this kind of um, um, perception, especially when mm -hmm. I refer to those verbs. So, yeah. so it took me a very long time to, um, to um, subconsciously um, have the similar reaction when I speak to, um, for example, Chinese verbs. So even though they are both the, refer to the same meaning, but when I say the Chinese verbs, then I have the um, proprioception. But when I speak English verbs, then I don't have that. So I, which um, leads to a very interesting, very exciting uh, process for me. Um, that is uh, when people learn in a different language, maybe give them this kind of um, simulation and then mm -hmm. so that to help them to build a yeah. link between the memory and the perception. To so you're gonna, I, I love that idea and you're gonna love this one. And I'm, I'm just a little embarrassed that I'm forgetting the name of the student because he's at UChicago right now with, um, he's in the lab of my colleague, Howard Nussbaum, who's a professor in psychology. He has a student who just joined and used to be at UIC before. When this student was at UIC, I think, I hope it's UIC that I'm saying correctly. He was doing a project where he was looking at stimulating the motor cortex, not with EMS or, or anything that is 
to a level that actually triggers motor stimulation, but just subconscious level that is enough to get the cortex going. And so it's called TDCS. So he was doing TDCS with the motor cortex as you're learning these words. It was actually in German, but they also exist in English where it's like mm. um, grasping a concept, right? We use the term grasping a concept literally would mean I take the concept and I grasp it. Yeah. And so people are learning this Greifen in German and stuff like that. They, they're learning these words and they're getting the motor stimulation when the words are motor based. And, and he found out, I believe, I, I, if I remember the paper correctly, that with the stimulation, folks were uh, retaining those concepts better. So I think that totally validates your concept, but you could take it further by using EMS and say like, well, but maybe I should actually enact those movements, because with that TDCS, you've got nothing. It's just a suppression or, or, or activation of the cortex. There's no, there's no physical output motor. Would I do EMS to teach those preceptive concepts? Would that help? I think that's a fantastic question, actually. You should totally do I that. I want, <laughs> I want to uh, ask you for uh, reference to this, because we've been looking at uh, this idea of teaching uh, kids uh, to learn uh, phonics by giving yeah. them objects to grasp and also smells to play with. Uh, I can definitely we've find done, it. We've done some preliminary work on this, but it'd be, it'd be really cool to see um, the details of that and see how we can uh, draw on some of that work. I can definitely find it and send it to you. And I'll be I'm really, just taking a note of that. I'll be really interested to know what's your book that you were talking about, the anthropology, because I'm really into this as well, so. We I will also send you that. I don't know I don't know the title by heart, but I'll, I'll send you yeah, that. Yeah, that would be lovely. If, we, if we've got time for another quick one, so I just, just got loads of questions. Um, just, <laughs> just, just wondering about um, skill and expert users. So just thinking of the mm -hmm. shooting the ball out of the air or perhaps the new drumming one, um, it'd be quite easy to say this will allow anyone to shoot a ball out of the air or anyone to be a drummer. But is, if, you, if you looked at uh, niche, the niche of like expert users, like already making a really good drummer even better, or maybe it's a skill that, yeah. I just wonder yeah. yeah, how that fits yeah. in. Had to be the musician asking that question. It has been a disaster, and I I love that it's a disaster because, well, obviously, so, so you know, in all the stuff you've seen today, there there there's one huge limitation, EMS, the, the precision of current EMS is absolutely disaster, right? So there's the, the reason why all the stuff you see on the slides is wrist movements, very large movement, biceps movement, and nobody's playing piano on my slides is because one I can't do it, and two. There's a reason why I can't do it, and a lot of people other can't do it because I'm not working on EMS alone. There's there's a, there's a bunch of fantastic people working on EMS, is because we can't unlock the precision needed for those fine motor movements, for for a bunch of the a bunch of reasons, right? So one of them is that we're stimulating outside of the skin, so we can't selectively target a particular muscle. The muscles, even if we could, the muscles are so tightly coupled that the current just goes everywhere. So three, four muscles fire at the same time. So if we try to move one finger, all of the fingers move. So I hope somebody can solve that one. Um, that being said, drumming is not particularly hard because you know just the wrist is already kind of good enough. And so we, we did a couple of things for super amateurs like, oh, I've never seen a drumstick. And they were learning really fast. And this is still ongoing work. They were learning really fast, especially their non-dominant hand, which blows my mind. So the, the left hand, which is uh, very hard, Pete knows because he, 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 he's a musician, super hard to speed up your non-dominant hand. And then you give that to experts and they're just confused. What I think is going on is that the experts have their super finely tuned control loops, right? And you're just trying to mess with this and interfere the hyper finely tuned control loops with imprecise, unfinely tuned in control loops of current EMS and it's just a disaster. So I think there are two things contributing to the disaster. One maybe we can solve right now, which is, okay, can somebody just make EMS better? And then at least we can try with high precision EMS. And then the other one I think is different and does not, is not just a technical issue is, okay, but what should we assist them with? Because these are super pros. Right, so maybe we can make them faster on this micro part of the movement or something, or timing wise, but not everything because they don't need everything. Yeah, so, so just ahead, wondering, Pete. just wondering across your studies, have you found any particular students or people who are really good at just all of them? <laughs> so, not an expert yeah, well, user in mu music, but an expert user in using EMS systems. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a good one. So, so in all fairness, in the in the drumming stuff that we're doing with Shinya and Keo, we've we've shortcutted that by just having pre-selection tasks, and then we just take like really bad drummers. 
Um, and, and we don't take Shinya, who's by the way, a professional drummer beyond being a neuroscience professor. He's actually a professional drummer. We don't take him. We don't take me, who's like an amateur drummer, but, but um, we'd only take the, the, the really naive ones. But what you're saying is something different which we had seen in repeated ways. And that's, this also lead us to, to the agency work, which is, I don't know if people are good at EMS, but what, I've, what we've seen is that there are different adaptation curves, right? So EMS is very surprising the first time it, 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 it kicks in because for your whole life, 20 plus years of your whole life, uh, all of your interactions with your muscles have been mostly top down. You think I'm gonna move, you move, it happens. And occasionally you have reflexes, but they're actually very little. Some folks, and so at the beginning is surprising, but after a few trials, people are like, all right, I get the gist of this. It's just about relaxing. Some people are really good at that and some have a bit more resistance. So when Osama yeah. was saying, can you design yeah. flexibility and all that, there's also- Parallel that. to maybe like hypnosis or something where some people are really good at it or, you know, and there's a kind of- yeah. I don't know if it's to hypnosis because I've never, I've never been subjected to it in a way that I could like embodily have a first person perspective to it. But yeah, it's it's- or even to to when like your karate teacher takes her hands and moves it. Some people are very, res I'm actually very resistant to movement. Like if you externally move me, it's a little hard. I'm, I have a hard time relaxing my muscles and just letting be moved because I'm tight control somehow. But, but others are like, yeah, I can totally turn off my own cognition. I don't know how they do that. And they just turn it off and they're like, oh, I see what you mean. And so that's why they learn faster than me. And I'm, I'm a crappy drummer, but, but I think but I think that's an interesting thing. It ties back to Osama's comment. Can we design not only more uh, rationalization for allowing you to, to be better with the moments without agency, but also more flexibility? How do, can we assist this, the, the folks that aren't as good as, as other folks in just letting go and being in that EMS uh, style? That's, that's an awesome design question. I hope, yeah, I hope folks also tackle that one. Okay, do we have any more questions? I think we never run that much over, did we? <laughs> oh my God. Uh, well, no, but that's sorry. good. I mean, like, you know, there yeah. a lot of, uh, it's been a very good discussion. I always feel like, because I know with Osama, we have a meeting 20 minutes ago and <laughs> we've been discussing, like, can you wait for us? We're just yeah, finishing that. We, we, we should make it officially an hour and a half uh, from here yeah. on. I always, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah that, that would work. <laughs> I think it'd probably be safer. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, thank you so much, Pedro. That was really yeah. for the invitation yeah. once more, and thanks for all, all yeah. the awesome questions. And be really looking you. forward to the thank you. Chat. Yeah. Cool. Bye, bye. bye everyone. Bye. 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 See you. Bye. 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 See ya. Take care.